Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to all of you to today's debate, Digital Services Act, Creating Effective Rules for Content Moderation in the EU. Our debate is hosted by EIF member Lina Galvez Munoz, MEP with the SD Group from Spain, Vice Chair of the Committee on Industry, Research and Energy, and Shadow Rapporteur of the Digital Services Act for this committee. Welcome, Lina, and thank you very much for taking the lead on this topic. Today, we are joined by four experts who will share their different perspectives on the Commission's proposal for a Digital Services Act. So a warm welcome to all our speakers, starting with Ricardo Castaneira, Digital Councillor at the Portuguese Presidency, Wouter Gekier, Head of Brussels Office at the European Broadcasting Union, Lisa Felton, Chair of the Mobile Commerce Operator Expert Group at the GSMA, and Frane Marojevic, Director of the Content and Jurisdiction Program at the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. Thank you all very much for joining us today. As always, after listening to our speakers, there will be an exchange of views uh, with our audience, so uh, with all participants, uh, which will take place in the Q&A session. But we will guide you there uh, later. And now, with no further ado, I leave the floor to our hosting MEP, uh, Lina Galvez Munoz, for her opening remarks. The floor is yours. Thank you, Varia Rosa. Thank you very much. And um, thank you very much to the EIF for organizing such a timely debate on the Digital Services Act proposal, uh, which, as you know, is currently being discussed in the European Parliament and in the in the in the Council. I thank you all also the expert for joining us uh, today and also the public. And uh, because we are now, right now, in the midst of a deep discussion which will define the internet of the, of the future, I think this piece of legislation aims at modifying, and it's very important because it will update uh, a 20-year-old legal framework set out in the e-commerce uh, directive. And this revision is uh, clearly needed since digital services and markets have evolved tremendously and at a high speed since um, the turn of the millennium. And uh, we have now new social challenges that have emerged, uh, such as the growing spread of hate speech or disinformation content, which have seen an uh, acceleration and accentuation during the pandemic. So. New legislation in this field is, is more, I will say that is more more than necessary. Um, I see the proposal uh, uh, as a very good starting point. However, uh, I believe we have to be truly ambitious and very clear as on top of the new social uh, challenges emerged, I just mentioned some of them before, we are also in front of a piece of legislation that has the potential of becoming a global standard. I mean, if we um, agree with this idea of the Brussels effect that uh, uh, spread everywhere, uh, therefore it's, it's much at stake and we have to do it right because this will be for Europe, but it could be also for other places. Um, this, the large, uh, global companies in this uh, area have acquired such market power, which come, uh, comes in hand in hand with the power to impose rules. And this trend do, do not stop growing. Um, and for that, probably we have to be realistic and accept that self-regulation does not work. Uh, we have seen the harms that occurs when there is no transparency as well, and we need to bring accountability into the system and achieve a systematic change on platform economy that benefits and protects users and users' rights with clear data protection provisions. Uh, the principal concern uh, identified um, is the clarification of the definition of online platforms and very large online platforms as uncertainties around such definitions can lead to misinterpretations and risk overburdening a wide range of platforms. Moreover, certain obligations might not refer to the types of services, for instance, providers 
of IT infrastructure services, for instance, cloud infrastructure services, as they do not have direct visibility or control over how customers use their services, including whether a customer chooses to make its content available to the public and what content is displayed. Of course, this need to be further analyzed. In addition, other aspects should be that should be further analyzed and clarified, such as content moderation, illegal content, just to ensure that what is legal offline is illegal online. Also, advertisement requirement requirements and their applicability, trusted flaggers, and who filters content and further clarify the role of the digital services coordinator the resources, whether they can face any limitations while assessing trusted flaggers, et cetera. Uh, moreover, we need to integrate uh, SMEs concerns, which are very relevant in the digital sphere, while ensuring that M MSC SMEs provide a secure environment to users and consumers. If micro and small enterprises are excluded from these obligations, we might risk having illegal content potentially moving from one larger platforms to the smaller ones. As well, online, online advertisement, additional measures are needed to protect the individual better when it comes to content moderation and online target advertising. We should aim at avoiding target advertisement based on pervasive tracking and to restrict categories of data that can be proceeded to enable or facilitate target advertising. A pool system must include human review. Um, very importantly, we need a framework to ensure the rights of users as they are often in hands of providers who decide to give or not a chance for an appeal. Algorithm decision system underpins a lot of functions provided by the online platforms. We believe that greater accountability on algorithm should, could be introduced in the proposal. And finally, I would like to highlight the need to improve coordination between member states and also between competent authorities and intermediary services, which allow agile, predictable and effective supervision and protection of public interest as well as as facilitating the access to EU national data protection authorities to any relevant data if they feel it necessary to assess compliance with the rules. Overall, our goal should be to transform the digital economy so that works for people by setting worldwide standard. I'm really looking forward to listening to your input and the discussion afterwards, because as I said before, we are dealing with a very, very important piece of legislation that will really help to shape our future. And we hope it is a good future for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lina, for setting the scene so well and starting the, uh, the conversation. And it is, as you said, it is very important uh, and it's important to get it right. So let's uh, uh, discuss with our experts and uh, let's welcome our first speaker, Ricardo Castanera, with the Portuguese presidency. Well, good afternoon. Uh, many thanks, Maria Rosa and uh, Lina Galvez for having me here. It's indeed a very important day to the Portuguese presidency. Uh, a milestone event is taking place here in Portugal at the same time, the Digital Assembly. But um, because everybody, I believe, has already a good knowledge of the proposal, the legislative proposal, let me remind you all um, about where we came from and where we are now. At the start of our Portuguese presidency, we set uh, very ambitious uh, goals for the digital uh, services package. Um, this was one of our priorities and we wanted really to move very fast. That's why we uh, are, to be honest, very proud of the results uh, of the first ministerial debate about the digital services package, uh, which took place uh, last week, as you know, during the Compact Council. 
all the ministers shared very detailed positions on the issues identified by the Portuguese presidency on the progress report, on the DSA progress report, but also on the DMA. It was really a very meaningful policy debate, which um, will allow us, especially on the DSA, which I'm in charge, to work further on the file. Both the two incoming presidencies, the Slovenian and the French one, uh, affirmed uh, their willingness to quickly move forward with the negotiations. And we are happy to have paved the way to their upcoming work. And uh, we will present to the member states a first compromise text by the end of our presidency during this month. In our compromise text, we are not avoiding any difficult issues but we are assuming a very balanced approach to trying to take on board as much as possible the member states comments and concerns as well as the stakeholders ones let me give some uh, zoom in to some of the most i would say disputed issues freedom of expression versus illegal content for example which has been already mentioned by lina it has been one of the most highlighted issues in the debates, which was already and also mentioned by uh, Vice President Bestager uh, as one of the most uh, sensitive ones. And it's really very difficult to take uh, or get a balance between protecting the freedom of expression and effectively tackling, tackling illegal content online. But it's now obvious to us that the large majority of member states, for example, are not in favor or are in favor, sorry, of not including harmful content in the scope. And that majority of member states are happy with the solution given in the proposal regarding the risk assessment and mitigation, the codes of conduct, external audits and other transparency provisions provisions on recommender systems and online ads. Maybe this will have to be reinforced. Some member states have proposed that users are also allowed to opt out from ads when they access the platforms, for example. However, most member states supported a tough stance regarding illegal content, especially regarding illegal products asking for more specific and more rigorous provisions on marketplaces. Some asked for stay down mechanisms and others asked for more ambitious know your business customer principle. We know that the parliament will also move this way, asking further action on marketplaces. So we are pretty sure that there will be room to discuss a solution in the future, probably when the trilogue starts. Then another important point raised by ministers and also during the last five, the last five months, it's um, during the discussions we've had at the working party and which reflects, reflects really, really well some of the most important concerns of the member states was about the cross-border enforcement of the rules, taking into account the principle of country of origin. While a majority of member states strongly supported the preservation of the country of origin as a cornerstone, cornerstone of the digital single market, other member states are concerned about the lack of enforcement of the rules and want more intervention powers to their national authorities. This is a very important aspect. Then we took a lot of time discussing about the micro and small enterprises, excluding or not, all member states supported the asymmetric approach of the proposal, including the carving out of micro and small enterprises. But there is also a group of member states that are open to reflect on further criteria to exclude the micro players, as they fear these platforms might become a depository of illegal content. The solution can be some form of risk-based approach, taking into account the number of users of these small players. We will see. Then the level of harmonization, also an important observation regarding the level of harmonization. There are some member states worried that the level of protection given by the DSA can be below their national provisions. And we are also discussing or still discussing this. I would like on my first uh, uh, 
uh, remarks to give you a, a quite good, I believe, uh, picture about where we came from and where we are. And very, very soon, we will deliver the first compromise text. Thank you, Maria Rosa. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo, for telling us uh, more about the work of, of the Portuguese presidency and the discussions that are ongoing at member state uh, uh, level. I mean, of course, you have touched upon some of uh, the very sensitive issues uh, of the DSA. We will discuss further also with the, with the other experts. Uh, let me now uh, give the floor to Wouter uh, Gekier with the European Broadcasting Union. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Maria Rosa, for your introduction. And also thank you uh, to Mrs. Galvez Munoz for setting the scene so well. Um, indeed, I think it's it's quite important, the Digital Services Act and the, the sense of urgency is, is, I think, not really an issue of discussions anymore, which, which is uh, great to see uh, across uh, the sectors and the policy-making uh, bodies. Uh, but we also need to get it right. Um, when Lina Galvez Munoz rightly said, we're here in the process of setting maybe a benchmark that will be relevant for the entire globe, we absolutely need to get it right, uh, this one. And we need to see eye to eye on the impact uh, platforms have on many sectors um, in Europe. And I uh, today will, in my few minutes intervention, focus on the impact uh, that we see online platforms have on the media, the media sector. I represent today the European Broadcasting Union, operating Eurovision and Euro Radio, as you can see. Together, we represent public service media companies from 115 uh, countries in and uh, beyond the European Union. Um, that includes, for instance, Spanish members such as Radio Televisión Española, but also a range of other public broadcasters in nearly every uh, member of the European uh, Union. Um, the Digital Services Act is not a media legislation. Let me get that straight. That is obviously very clear to us and to our membership. But the impact, of course, will be huge for us. The Internet is not just a place where you trade goods and services, but where you also actually um, access information, entertainment and news. There was a very telling figure last year in the Reuters Institute's research that shows that most of us um, actually, when accessing news online, go often to a so-called side door online. So instead of going to some of our news outlets that we represent or a commercial media outlet or a publisher, uh, a consumer, an audience in Europe prefers to actually access news to a social network, a news aggregator. So uh, whatever investment that we um, put in as the EBU membership, but also media or publishing sectors, we still rely quite heavily now on, on third party platforms that are often owned by global uh, platforms with uh, gatekeeping power. Brings us also to the DMA discussion, but that is not uh, for today. So what I'm sharing today is basically a range of experience that have come back from our journalists, from our editors, uh, and also media professionals working uh, across Europe for public media and for the audiences ultimately, because the public service media companies get their mandate, of course, at national level and are actually obliged to cater for a, a wide range of audiences and catering for quite diverse needs. So we actually what happens on these platforms is also a concern and an interest for us as media companies. Uh, we all know global platforms have that deciding role that they're playing, the active role that is heavily discussed amongst uh, ourselves here. Um, and it's clear this is, is an improvement to set uh, a clear set of rules for online platforms to improve their diligence, to improve their obligations, um, notably when it comes to tackling online, uh, illegal uh, content online. So let it be clear, the feedback we got from our membership uh, also involves a lot of illegal content floating around online. Uh, that includes, of course, the copyright infringing material, but also plenty of content that actually is uh, catalogued as hate speech, which is illegal under national and EU standards, and a strong stand is needed. I think we all agree there um, a robust uh, approach is needed, whether it's transparency in Article 13, the traceability that could be beneficial uh, for um, or applied to all business users in Article 22, and more generally, re reporting systems and um, notice and take action uh, systems. So that is an important third message. The second one, which came very strongly back from our membership and from our media professionals, is that the Digital Services Act is also relevant for access to news and, and ensuring there is uh, access to media online uh, without uh, arbitrary interventions by online platforms. Because 
our relationship, let's face it, with platforms is sometimes good, but, can, but, but it's also a challenge sometimes. We are facing unilaterally imposed terms, terms and conditions, and platforms also have to work out what they consider illegal and lawful uh, themselves. And we increasingly um, uh, encounter examples where there are such interventions by platforms based on terms and conditions, which mean that media applications, media services, media content is actually removed from platforms, even though it was visible, it was present uh, on there uh, already. Um, and we think that is an issue. Uh, we think that's an issue because there is actually a, a whole range of rules, professional standards, ethical standards that apply to media services and content. Um, there's a range of uh, aki there which proves it and continues to be very, very relevant up to the day. So we would hope our wish is that the Digital Services Act could establish a clear role or rule there in the Digital Services Act um, that platforms are not allowed to meddle with content that is coming from media operators and publishing companies that are established in the EU and abide by all uh, regulatory standards and professional standards in Europe and at national level. We come up with a range of um, examples to demonstrate that and I'm happy to share with anyone who, who would show an interest in that. Second of all, there's of course also an issue of building trust with the audiences online and part of that trust is actually visibility of brands and logos. And that is a very important uh, part of the story, not just for media, I should say, but whenever a business user, is it a media company or another one, another uh, user, goes online to offer services, offer news, offer media content, offer the sale of goods, uh, it is in their interest and in the interest of audience uh, to know who they're dealing with. And we've also come across numerous examples where we feel uh, our logos, our brands were not properly displayed on platforms. So for media, that is a huge issue, as you can imagine. Um, and it, it, it really is quite diverse, the set of examples we get. There is actually a large video sharing platform that offers content for kids. And whenever a public broadcaster who have an excellent track record in producing kids content offers it on this video sharing platform, we see that the logos are not properly displaced of the broadcaster that was actually in charge of editing and producing the content. Again, there is an issue there that we need to address. And we feel, uh, we feel that uh, the DSA is definitely uh, the right opportunity to address uh, some of those um, examples. Third point, we take the point that very large platforms are subject to some of the specific rules. On online advertising, for instance, we're very much supporting uh, the, the direction of travel towards more uh, advert um, transparency. We do question maybe uh, limit the limiting of some of the provisions to only very large platforms. And I'm, I'm singling out the example of recommender systems because you also refer to it, Mrs. Galvez Munoz, which is for now really restricted to transparency only of recommender systems. And if that is the case, we feel it's quite so crucial that it would need to apply to all online platforms. To tackle some of the unfair practices that are sometimes um, driven by uh, the application of recommender system. And uh, we refer to our positioning on the Digital Markets Act because we feel there is a big uh, push there and a big opportunity also to tackle some of the unfair practices that are triggered by the use of recommender systems by global online platforms. Lastly, I think there are technical points to sort, but I think that is just um, an issue of sitting down and, and clarifying things on how the Digital Services Act will relate to some of the media regulation already in place. But I think I'm confident based also on what Ricardo says, that there is probably a genuine commitment to kind of find the solution. On enforcement, I can only tell you that we are functioning in a uh, sector which is heavily regulated. So there's a lot of um, experience there also uh, working with media regulators on how to sort issues. So we would hope also that is taken into, into account in setting up a very efficient enforcement and oversight uh, mechanism for the DSA. I'd, I'd leave it at that and thank you so much for uh, your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Walter, for uh, um, explaining uh, to us uh, the impact of the, the DSA on uh, the broadcasters, although it isn't, as you said, um, a piece of, of media legislation per se, but definitely there's uh, a lot uh, uh, to work on. Uh, for the broadcasters. Uh, um, let's now bring in a different perspective with uh, Lisa Felton with the GSMA. 
Thank you and good afternoon. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak today and for the excellent presentations we've had so far. So I'm speaking today on behalf of the GSMA and representing the mobile communications industry. And the GSMA welcomes the publication of the DSA, which alongside the DMA marks a watershed moment in the regulation of the digital sector. You may ask, why is this important for the mobile sector? The DSA impacts on us in two ways. Firstly, we're a, a mere conduit, so we offer that um, network delivery service. And secondly, we've also been impacted quite severely by illegal content. During the pandemic, we've seen how crucial connectivity has been to enable people to carry on working, learning, communicating. And that's also reflected in the upcoming digital decade targets with the um, target that all populated areas should be covered by 5G by 2030. However, during the pandemic, the mobile industry has faced an aggressive and coordinated disinformation campaign in relation to 5G. The impact of this has been quite severe. The disinformation that we saw online has resulted in people setting fire to masts, injuring engineers, it's had a direct effect on the quality of networks, impacting in turn emergency services, people working from home, children learning from home. To date, there have been 332 arson attacks across 21 countries as a result of this disinformation. And this problem is not going away. This disinformation has been roundly condemned by governments and scientists, both the European Commission and the World Health Organization have issued statements making it clear that there is no connection between 5G and COVID. We've also worked very closely with national governments, but the problems continue. This is why we really welcome a structural solution here. This is, we think, the right time for the revision of the e-commerce directive, which is over 21 years old and was written before the time Facebook existed, before the iPhone was produced. And the directive is really important because it provides an exemption uh, for liability um, for illegal content, effectively making the internet work, um, provided that hosting platforms remove illegal content as soon as they are aware. The issue for us is that at the same time as it disincentivizes platforms from taking proactive steps to address illegal content and actually removes the liability exemption if they do so. Going to what was discussed earlier, we, we think the DSA strikes the right balance between maintaining fundamental rights such as freedom of expression and ensuring a safer and healthier digital environment. We believe notice and takedown is still the right and the key way to address legal content. And we also think it's reasonable and proportionate to target new obligations um, on online platforms, especially very large um, online platforms. In particular, we welcome the more proactive approach to addressing the disinformation um, issue, and especially around illegal material um, through the risk assessment framework and reporting without removing the liability exemptions. We have three suggestions for areas for improvement. And this isn't all the suggestions we have, it's just the ones I wanted to highlight today. The first suggestion is that action should be taken by the provider closest to the content, which means that action is targeted and proportionate. Removing illegal content, for example, is easiest for the service provider hosting that content or the online platform rather than intermediaries lower down in the stack. For example, if we as a network are asked to block um, content as a result of a court order, we usually have to block an entire website. We're not able to remove specific content, which is usually encrypted. Any blocking at the network level should be a remedy of last resort. Our second recommendation is to keep in mind the careful balance of obligations. The current proposals tend towards um, just about the right balance, but with slightly, um, I would say slightly too onerous. For example, transparency reporting should apply only to online platforms, which would be more targeted and proportionate. There should definitely be no extension of uh, additional obligations, again, lower down in the stack where they're not appropriate, 
such as know your um, business re requirements in relation to mere conduits or um, intermediaries. Finally, online platforms should, on a best effort basis, prevent the re-upload of illegal content, which is known to be illegal content, which would prevent the kind of issues that we have seen in relation to disinformation on 5G. It is our hope that the DSA will have a transformational impact on society and really set that benchmark that we all want it to do, preventing illegal content which can cause such wide damage to our societies. We fully support a harmonized approach that provides more certainty and the stability is necessary for Europe's overall recovery. The GSMA is here to work constructively with all stakeholders to achieve a positive conclusion. And we look forward to discussing this on an ongoing basis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa, for your presentation, for explaining uh, the impact of the DSA on the mobile uh, sector, and uh, especially when it comes to disinformation, as you, as you mentioned. Uh, we're now ready to uh, welcome our uh, last but not least uh, speaker, Frane Marojevic, the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. Uh, thank you, Maria Rosa, and thank you to all the others presenters for presenting their views on this uh, important piece of legislation. I mean, two of the questions that were posed for the discussion today are how to best create harmonized framework to tackle illegal content while protecting users' fundamental rights online, and how to ensure cross-border application of the new rules. And I will try and address this because that, these are exactly the questions that we are looking at and addressing in the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. I guess many of our participants today don't know much about the network, so I'll just say a few words, because we bring together over 200 experts from governments, from the largest internet companies, technical operators, the civil society, academia, and international organizations to address the tensions between the cross-border internet and national jurisdictions. The goal of the network is to create a collaborative environment where we can find ways to make competing jurisdictions compatible and interoperable. And recently we compiled the work and the outcomes by this great group of experts into three toolkits that provide some of the answers to managing uh, cross-border regulations of the internet. Most countries around the world are now looking at legislating online activities. And as was mentioned already, the Digital Services Act will be one of the most important pieces of legislation with potentially a global reach. However, in absence of global harmonizations of rules and regulations, conflicting and varying requirements by different states around the world are increasingly restricting the accessibility of information and services that has made the internet an incredible tool for cooperation, for communication and for trade, effectively creating a splinter net. And this is now a major transnational challenge. It is extremely positive that the EU is regulating together as the 27 member states, rather than through a patchwork of 27 or more pieces of legislation. However, there will be challenges to ensure a harmonized approach, both within the EU and especially with third countries. And let me give you a couple of, of examples. The key objective of the Digital Services Act is to tackle illegal content. However, what is illegal in one country or one EU member state may not be illegal in another, and vice versa. The DSA will not harmonize the criminal codes of the 27 member states. So when issuing orders on restrictions based on illegality under the Digital Services Act, the respective authorities will have to specify the territorial scope of the restrictions. So in which country should the restriction apply in addition to their own? This is a completely new concept. And what is needed are what will be the criteria that they will use to reach these decisions? How will they ensure that they are not imposing their own standards on other countries in the EU, but also imposing their standards globally, as the orders in theory could be global? This is an extremely complex question that has serious human rights implications and that one uh, that the experts in our policy network have spent a lot of time thinking about and working on. This is not the only challenge the DSA will be implemented by at least 27 national regulators. 
and it will be essential to avoid a patchwork of regulation through different interpretations and different regulatory practices and pr procedures. In order to ensure interoperability and a harmonized approach uh, to the rules, there will be a need for common understanding of the problems, a need for shared terminology, taxonomies, common procedures, common standards for recourse mechanisms, for example, transparency was mentioned, what will be the transparency requirements between the states, and other tools for cooperation, so not just between the regulators themselves, but also between the regulators and platforms and with other stakeholders. Um, this is something that we know because this is what we are working on at the, in the network, and we have produced a number of tools and procedures for such interoperability. And what we have learned is that this is a complex process. It requires a multi-stakeholder input. We, it cannot be just left to the officials, the regulators and the administrators, however competent they are. Effective and rights-respective solutions, technical solutions, also need to be inclusive of the views of all the stakeholders, the authorities, civil society, internet companies, academia and the others. So to summarize, my key contribution to this discussion is that the Digital Services Act is by ensuring uh, that there is at least one overarching regulation in the 27 EU member states is a great step at avoiding the splintering of the internet within the EU. But in order to have an effective, a coherent implementation that strengthens due process and human rights protections, there will be a need to create an inclusive multi-stakeholder process for its implementation. That process needs to create all the necessary tools for both cooperation within the EU and within the and with third countries.